All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I think we've got a very exciting and special evening uh, for you with a, a special guest and alumnus of the university. Uh, I'm Grant Hartzog. I'm uh, the executive director of our new global and community health program. And I'm a professor in the molecular cell and developmental biology here. Oh, I'm a professor at the, in the MCD biology program here and the executive director of our new global and community health program. Um, you're going to see more of me tonight. Uh, but I'd like to start this evening uh, by thanking uh, Chancellor Larive, who's really responsible uh, for uh, this evening. She met with uh, our speaker, Lori Garrett, several months ago in New York and convinced Lori to come out and uh, visit us. So I'm very thankful for that and for all of the Chancellor's support in helping us launch our new program in global and community health. Uh, we, we truly appreciate it. So I... And so I would like to invite the Chancellor up to and introduce our speaker tonight. Well, thank you, Grant. I would say, I don't think it took that much convincing to get Lori to come, but uh, we're so delighted that you're here. Uh, I'd like to just say good evening to everybody and thank you for coming. And we're so delighted you can join us. This is going to be a fascinated evening, isn't it? And I've seen several people, Lori, with various iterations of books in their bags. And so I know that uh, um, folks are really excited that you could be here. You know, Lori is one of the world's most influential and authoritative writers on global infectious diseases. And she has just been a pioneer. And, um, you know, it shows, I think, what an intelligent woman and a talented reporter can do as they lean into science and facts and the enormous influence that she's had in public, political, and scientific understanding of health. And I'm deeply proud to say, too, that Lori is a UC Santa Cruz alumna. from Merrill College, and her work reflects our deep campus-wide commitment to social justice, to science, to truth, and community engagement. And her association with, with UC Santa Cruz is a source of pride for me and for our campus. So she's the op author of numerous best-selling books. The Coming Plague, New Newly Emerging Diseases, in a World Out of Balance, Betrayal of Trust, The Collapse of the Global pub Public Health, and I Heard the Sirens Scream, How Americans Responded to the 9-11 and Anthrax Attacks. She was uh, re awarded a Pulitzer Prize in 1995 for reporting on the Ebola epidemic in Zaire, and was a senior fellow of global health and at the Council on Foreign Relations from 2003 to 2017. Lori was called Cassandra by the New York Times for predicting the COVID-19 pandemic and other outbreaks. This is a, a reference to the Greek priestess who was doomed to utter prophecies that no one would believe. <laughs> Former National Security Advisors Richard A. Clark and R.P. Eddy dubbed her a two-time Cassandra for urging government action on both pandemic preparedness and control over the rogue use of gene-manipulating technologies. She is currently a columnist for the magazine and website Foreign Policy and a science contributor to MSNBC. I'm really grateful that uh, Lori was able to make time to join us tonight. Global and community health has never been a more important topic than it is today. And we've responded at UC Santa Cruz in turn with a new program that will prepare students and provide research to solve current and future global health problems. 
So this fall, we launched two new campus degrees, a BS and a BA in global and community health. Our goal is to educate a new generation of health leaders and health workers with expertise drawn from a wide array of disciplines and with the ability to communicate and learn from one another across uh, the diversity of perspectives. Through this interdisciplinary education, we hope to contribute to the health of all the communities, global and local, in which our students will work in the future. And importantly, the education of students in both these new degree pathways will benefit from wider commitments to social justice that have held a prominent place on our campus since our founding. I wanted to acknowledge Grant Hartzog, who you met earlier, and also Matt Spark, who really have been the energy and the leadership behind developing these degree programs. Uh, we don't want uh, global health to simply be words in the title of a course or on a degree, but rather something that we actively advance in the world at large. So I'd like to thank you again for coming. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Lori Garrett. Go slugs. I heard an abominable thing from one of the students. Uh, I've had many undergraduates escorting me around the campus in endless meetings. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, the student said, yeah, you know, it's widely known among uh, the African American and Latinx students here that there was segregation at UCSC and that all uh, students of color were required to attend Merrill and Crown and were discriminated against attending other colleges. And I said, who the hell is saying that? Uh, you know, it's amazing how those of us that go back a ways at this institution start hearing great myths and sorrowful tales about this magnificent institution um, that we all had the good grace and fortune of attending. Um, and it's a pleasure to know that now folks I can't see down here <laughs> Matt and Grant are creating a, a genuine global health program here at UCSC. That's, that's just terrific. So what I want to do here today is take you on a really fast-paced journey. If you can't see a screen somewhere very clearly, I suggest you move um, and get where you can see very clearly uh, because this is going to go boom, 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 boom. And um, it's, a, it's a journey of my own why I have become so deeply angry and disappointed with what has happened with COVID, not just in our nation, but worldwide. And what I think were the great missed opportunities and I fear would be missed again with the next microbe and the next and the next. And believe me, there will be a next and a next and a next. So um, to date, as of data this week, we've had uh, 6 million people worldwide, 6.6, .6, who have died of COVID. And of those, um, the vast major largest number have been in the United States. This is where we stand, although the case numbers are, of course, ludicrous because nobody's really reporting the majority of infections anymore. And measuring antigens at home means that nobody really knows about it. In the early days, in 2020, case fatality rates were very high. Here in the United States, 1.67% of all infections resulted in death. But that's changed with the variants because they become less virulent but more contagious. What we have that we have to worry about is long COVID. We have millions of undiagnosed long COVID cases in the United States and all over the world. And in many cases, it's clear, and we've known since 2020, that it had a physiological basis with direct damage done to cells that are of your heart and your endothelial system, your entire cardiovascular system, and that this looks to be permanent. There's really no good reason to believe that this kind of damage is going to be reversible, especially when you find cells with no nuclear material, no DNA, no RNA, they've been just punched right out. This is not gonna be a cell that can ever function again. 
were similarly finding individuals that had no symptoms, were asymptomatically infected, and yet they are showing long-term cardiac damage from having the virus in their bodies and the sort of inflammatory response directed against the viral infection of a profound immune response. In Big Ten college athletes, a survey in 2020 found that 15% of those who had been infected were suffering heart damage and that it was actually slowing down their performance, their ability to take up oxygen um, and their VO2 max was lowered by exposure to the virus, whether or not they had a severe case. A giant British survey in the British Biobank of brain damage fa has found profound and likely permanent brain damage caused by infection with this virus. And uh, we're seeing that it's in several parts of the brain. There's definitely damage in the cerebellum, and there is aging, perhaps by as much as eight years from a single infection uh, with the virus. In a sense, it's creating dementia. You can look at brain scans and see significant damage. And if you look at this one, you can see a, a difference in gray matter in the brain um, as a direct result of infection with this virus. And the list of syndromes that are now associated and may be permanent with COVID infection is very long. Some of it is so vague that it's, the individual doesn't experience it. Let me just go back. The individual doesn't experience it as vague. They experience it as life-changing, as urgent, as somebody please help me. But if you are a physician looking at this list, any three or four of these symptoms might be present in a patient. It's very hard to know what to say and what to do. Even Tony Fauci, who calls it brain fog, says, I don't know what to tell people. And we look down the road and we can see we're going to have massive economic consequences of an underperforming labor force or a labor force that's in fact going to be absent in many cases because of the impact of long COVID. So far beyond the impact that we associate with direct mortality and broken families, we have an economic consequence that we're going to be living with for a very long time. And I think if we go in the Wayback Machine and think about where things stood on the eve of cusp of our knowledge of the Wuhan outbreak, we actually had a booming economy. Wall Street was going bananas. Anybody that had investment um, in Wall Street had seen their stocks just soar in value and look forward to a comfortable retirement. Um, the Dow was growing at a serious pace and some of the fastest growing centers of economic development were actually in what had been the poorest countries in the world. Africa was just going berserk. The growth was stupendous. The Dow was swelling all through December 2019. Um, and now, where we, where we were barely, you know, uh, days later, we were, looking at, we were looking at huge GDP growth that showed that we'd basically erased the damage of the 2008 financial crisis. This is not staying where you want it. Uh, and <clears throat> let me just go back because I got interrupted there. Uh, but we, we, were, we saw this great... Uh, this great improvement in global economy on the eve of the disaster. And here's where we are now, according to the International Monetary Fund. We're looking at the most sluggish growth the world economy has seen uh, since the Great Depression. Global growth is forecast to slow all the way down to 2.7%, while inflation is going to just keep rising and rising for unclear how long. Um, and we're clearly, this is clearly about the combination of the COVID crisis, the associated supply chain crisis, uh, and the disruption uh, thanks to Mr. Putin. We're now calling this the $16 trillion virus. And I, you know, nobody involved in pandemic awareness back before COVID would have imagined this kind of a price tag associated with an epidemic. It's also had, you know, huge problems associated with deep political divides. Wherever there was some division to begin with, COVID has made it worse. We've seen rising nationalism and political divisions, the collapse of everything associated with globalization, generalized distrust of governments regardless of their political stripe, 
huge attacks on scientists and public health, and we've been fighting it like a whack-a-mole game. Each new variant comes up, oh, do we have a vaccine? Oh, do we have something we can do? From the very beginning, we had a game of blaming another country, saying this virus was created in somebody's lab or this came from somewhere else, and I do or don't trust my government. I do or don't trust that other government. Um, by the way, those of you who majored in math will know how crazy that woman's sign is. Um, <laughs> and I want to take you to April 2020, a time when in my part of New York, we had bodies in the streets and a time when a giant 18-wheeler refrigerator truck was just down the street from me, loaded with cadavers. It was only a time of about a half a million no known cases, and they were largely distributed across European countries and China, uh, with the exception of South Korea. Yet to come were any significant numbers in the United States, uh, except New York City, and significant numbers in most of Asia. By April 10th, 2020, this was what kind of looked like the global picture. Already the US was beginning to be a leader, unfortunately, in COVID. And Secretary General Antonio Guterres asked me to address his executive council to tell them what is the status of this epidemic, where is it headed, and what are our options? And this was uh, at the heads of every single UN agency in a private meeting that had to be executed on Zoom, my, my first Zoom meeting. <laughs> At that time, there were two big model forecasts that had been done by a team in Hong Kong and a team in the UK, and they had both kind of reached the conclusion that we could be looking at 50 million deaths with 65 to 80% of the population getting infected from this virus. And I said, you have two options. You have one scenario, the rich world takes care of itself. You have another scenario, global eradication, minimally elimination of human-to-human -human transmission with a global effort. Which scenario do you want to follow? So here's scenario number one, the rich takes care of itself. All the wealthiest countries of various parts of the planet would, for the short term, take economic consequences of crippling quarantines and lockdowns to buy time until they had a vaccine. Once uh, anything to do with a vaccine would of course uh, end up being patented and manufacturers would uh, roll out product to the wealthy purchasing agents, meaning governments, first. Um, and we would see that the virus would cycle southern hemisphere, northern hemisphere, so that each time we thought we had it under control, there would be another surge, another wave coming back at us over and over. Affordable vaccines would not be available for poor countries for many years, I said at that time, and uh, without, unless the United Nations intervened. And SARS-CoV-2 ultimately would become endemic, a permanent feature, just like HIV did back in the 1980s now a permanent part of our public health landscape. It, this would mean that the rich world would then be on the hook for decades to come, financing healthcare and COVID control in poorer countries all over the world, just as we have done with HIV. And we would once again see a permanent burden on the whole UN system for yet another layer of disease, another layer of public health necessity that would require transfer of resources from the wealthy world to the rich, I mean, the rich world to the poor world. In scenario two, you have a very different picture. You're imagining that the target goal is effective, effective vaccination of seven and a half billion people. That's a shared, universal, global goal and that it would be, uh, have to require that the two great enemies, China and the United States, would collaborate. This is not outrageous, I told the UN, because after all, that's what happened with smallpox at the height of the Cold War, when the United States and the Soviet Union jointly called for the eradication of smallpox and ex executed a successful campaign that saved hundreds of millions of lives and was effectively uh, executed by 1977. Um, smallpox was, of course, easier. There was no animal that had smallpox, only humans, and we had an effective vaccine. 
but I said we could take a page from that and we can ask what technologies do we need to urgently develop to conquer this problem. First and foremost, a point of care diagnostic. Some cheap, fast, truly effective way of knowing do, are there asymptomatic carriers? Of course, the answer is more than 90% of transmission is from asymptomatic individuals. Can we identify who is infected and do so rapidly? Can we put information in, and track vaccination rates on open clouds uh, so that we have universal access to information and data regarding vaccination trends and um, who needs immunization, who is not receiving it? Can we come up with a, an authentication website that can track global access? And again, make it transparent, make it available for everybody to see. Are the people of this country protected, of that country protected? Where are the holes in our safety net um, internationally? Can we exclude patents for the sake of the pandemic? Um, exercise the TRIPS Accord, go for the, not the ego of the nations, but the eco of the nations, as Bansky would put it. And can we delineate truly important and vital aspirational goals for this Operation Warp Speed vaccine? Uh, I said it had to be single dose, non-injection, uh, no cold chain necessary to maintain stability, uh, inhalation or perhaps nasal or dermal delivery, high safety standards, minimally 98% successful, and I want to go back to this because it's so important, 98% effective at blocking transmission. Not keeping you out of the hospital, blocking you from even getting uh, tr genuinely infected. Affordable pricing, um, Enormous incentive fund had to be created to provide billions of dollars for distribution of vaccine. It's not any good if it just sits in a warehouse. And, and immediate negotiations to bring all the various UN and per, uh, satellite agencies into the game and know how they're going to work. And we had to identify all animal carriers. Every species that would be contributing to uh, being reservoirs of the virus. Um, and that primarily meant let's shut down all the wildlife markets and wet markets, especially across Asia, that might have animals harboring the virus. We had to start measuring the surveillance of the environment. Where, what, tr what signals can we get out of the environment about the presence of virus, which went to microbiome research, measuring things like wastewater supplies, uh, sewage systems, uh, hospital uh, waste. And we had to figure out systems that would engage citizenry, not just uh, PhDs, because we didn't have a big enough army of PhDs to do the job. I likened it to doing environmental surveillance for lingering cases of polio as we approach eradication because we found polio showing up in the sewage in Israel back in 2013, in Melbourne, Australia in 2017, places that had eradicated disease, but the virus is still there. So we had to come up with immediate systems for doing global access to on-site pathogen detection. Can we get look at water effluent, wastewater effluent and identify the presence of virus, a warning system. We also needed to scale up productions of affordable, all the drugs associated with treatment of COVID and make it equitably accessible all over the world and create ethical and legal interface ahead of legal cases. Anticipate pitfalls for civil liberties, say with quarantine, with uh, privacy issues and be prepared and take them into consideration. And we had to create a communication system that emphasized a collective attempt of humanity to conquer a virus and engaged people in a sense of solidarity in a march to defeat the microbe. And as part of that, we had to engage all the social media outlets, get ahead of the trolls and the disruptors. Remember, I'm saying this in April of 2020 and create social media campaigns that rally the forces for vaccination, for cooperation, for solidarity across the world against the virus, which would mean identifying ahead of time the likely disinformation sources like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and bringing them on board in one-to-one -one respectful conversation before they become identified with an anti-COVID response effort. 
In other words, identify your opinion makers and win them over. And how would we finance all this in an equitable way? I was advocating uh, imposing the Tobin tax, which was first created by the economist uh, James Tobin back in 1972. This is to levy specific kinds of monetary uh, transactions in excess of $250,000 um, by placing a 0.05% tax on uh, certain kinds of monetary transactions that would go into a fund controlled by the United Nations for equitable activities. My take home act, uh, message was that we have the possibility of pursuing two different courses of operation. One would be business as usual, everybody on their own, and the result would be an endemic, permanent new feature of disease in human um, activity. And the other would be a resource-directed, aspirational effort that would fundamentally not only bring COVID under control, but change the way we perceive public health as a global effort of solidarity based on a combination of all sorts of forces. Unfortunately, the response from the UN was, your first question was, can we get China and the United States to work together? And the answer is no. And then you began to see almost immediately, everybody took different types of responses. No two nations were doing the same thing. No two nations were using the same toolkit. And this huge difference between in the purple, very stringent lockdown efforts versus in the blue, a sort of laissez-faire approach to the epidemic. This is because we don't have any governance over epidemics. We don't actually have governance over pathogens. No one really governs earth biology. And so in the Anthropocene, we're truly lacking any governance that could protect global human health. What we need is demo democracy engaged directly in the biome. We need to create toolkits that bring everyone into the effort of understanding what is in our environment and providing early warning systems and response capacity. A kind of globalization 2.0, I think of it as. Not a corporate globalization, a citizen globalization. And I think it could be accomplished as we get to imagining ever cheaper ways to sample the environment and genomically identify what is present in all kinds of different sources, food, water, wastewater, you name it, and begin to bring citizen soldiers or microbiome soldiers to the battlefront so that we have a permanent and long-standing way of knowing what is exactly going on in our environment. I thank you. Thank you, Lori. So now I uh, would like to invite two of our new global and community health uh, faculty up to engage in a conversation with Lori. And uh, the first of these uh, new faculty is Alicia Riley, who's an assistant professor. Uh, her home department is sociology. And uh, she comes to us from uh, UCSF. Uh, Professor Riley uh, co-directs the Pandemic Equity and Analytics Research uh, Lab up at UCSF with her colleague, Yei Hong uh, Chen where their research focuses on the inequities and in pandemic mortality, impacts on bereavement and mental health, and how inequities can be modified through policy. And then her partner tonight is Valerie Cortez, who's an assistant professor in my department, MCD Biology. Um, and for over 10 years, Valerie has worked on just about every RNA virus that's out there, as far as I can tell. Uh, she studies RNA virus immunity uh, and pathogenesis, and her research uh, goal uh, presently is to understand how host virus interactions uh, function in the gut. So thanks to all of you. And just remember, if you have questions, uh, we have note cards that you can write them down, and we'll have some time at the end to ask a few audience questions as well. Thank you, Grant, and thank you so much, Lori. Can we give her another round of applause? really very energizing and so much perspective. And I, I feel very lucky to be here to get a chance to reflect with you on your just tremendous career, 
I don't know if all of you realize that Lori has been making these um, calls for an early warning system for environmental screening since her book in 1994, probably even before that, um, for, for detecting emerging infectious threats. And um, you continue to do so persuasively, but I wanted to give you a chance to reflect on how your call has evolved, how it's evolved as you've lived through um, different pandemics, epidemics, SARS, you know, COVID, um, how it's evolved as technologies have advanced, how it's evolved now in the current era of the climate crisis. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, no small question. <laughs> By the way, I'm like shivering madly. Uh, I left New York, it was in the 70s. I didn't think I needed anything heavier than this little thing. <sighs> um, so when I first started sort of seriously thinking about emerging diseases, it was HIV that, of course, brought me to the plate. And uh, all the issues that we're describing played out with HIV. I traveled from country to country as HIV was first emerging. And, um, <coughs> excuse me. and I saw every government make the same mistakes over and over and over again discriminate against the populations at risk. You know, uh, if it was prostitutes in one country or gay men in another country or IV drug users, whatever the case, discriminate against them, uh, deny them services, accuse them of being responsible for their own illness, and, and then get paranoid about th anything that might go to the general society like the blood system. Um, and then as treatments became available, they were only available in the rich world, and the price tag was insane. I mean, initially, an effective course of antiretroviral therapy was about $20,000 a year. And that was hard, tough for us to take, and you can imagine what it would be like if you lived in Kailicha in South Africa. So um, I realized, look, HIV should never have been allowed to reach the scale it did. It was a slow spreading virus. It was not respiratory. You know, it, there, there were multiple opportunities to have brought that thing to a halt. It was only bigotry that became the major ally of that virus. And so, yeah, I started looking at more and more epidemics. I mean, I have lost count of how many epidemics I've been in, but in every single case, early warning has failed. Either there was never a diagnostic, or the diagnostic was not widely available and wasn't put in place in a practical way. And we've shifted from seeing the problem, we meaning American power, if you will. <coughs> Excuse me. I need a little water. Sorry. We've shifted from looking at it in a very, very colonial way which was, um, you know, it would be really nice if, if you, you know, from poor country, could you just keep the viruses in your country, please? Because we really don't want them here. Yeah. So we're going to give you some money for some programs so that you can keep them there. And um, if, you, if it does get really bad, we're not going to let you fly to America. You're not going to be allowed in our hospitals. You got it? Okay. So that was our first way. And then it got a little more progressive because, you know, well, a Democrat was in power. And so then it was, um, we want to set up a sentinel system. We're going to train you in how to look for, like, dying chickens that might have bird flu or whatever we're worried about. And um, our CDC is going to be your savior. So just wait, and then the jumbo jet will show up, and they'll, they'll come on in and rescue you all and stop the whole darn thing. Well, that didn't work out real well. And I should say that it wasn't just America doing this. I mean, I was so frustrated with the EU, with the UK, um, you know, all the wealthy world. The one big exception was the Japanese. And, you know, Japan was a country thoroughly, completely, 100% devastated at the end of World War II. And yet they had the chutzpah to say, 
our t we're going to put in our new constitution that there will be universal access to health care for every single Japanese citizen by 1960. And when you consider the state that Japan was in in 1945, they achieved it. It's, it's like a miracle. And they felt, okay, now we have to teach the whole world how to do this. And they really took it on in the UN system. They took it on all over the world as their number one issue. And when HIV emerged, they said, we have to fund an, an emerging diseases program. We have to get the whole world on board. And that led to the creation of things like the Global Fund uh, to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. But there are very few other countries that have really taken that kind of a role. And where I think we are now is that um, the CDC has lost its reputation. And there's very few countries saying, could the CDC please fly over and help us? Um, and our own credibility as a voice of how to fight disease has been undermined by the fact that we're the country with the highest death burden in the world. Uh, and that we seem to be completely incapable of acting in any kind of solidarity as a nation in response to COVID about any measure, regardless of whether the Republican guy is in or the Democrat guy is in. Um, so at this point, uh, you know, when I say we need rapid diagnostics and we need to be out there in a sustainable, permanent fashion funding surveillance, um, I, you know, I, I feel like there's less listening today than there was 20 years ago. <laughs> I'll put it right here. Thanks. Glamorous. <laughs> no, that's really interesting because, you know, I feel like in this pandemic, uh, you know, we had a number of medical interventions that we were able to sort of pull off the shelf and sort of re implement, right, to respond. Um, but I'm wondering about those public health interventions you know, that we, we would rely on, right? Like contact tracing. Um, so what is your take on sort of what happened, what kind of went wrong, and what we can do better next time in terms of those public health sort of standard operations? So this is such an interesting question because when the CDC has been in charge in the past of, um, you know, the kind of the global response to say an Ebola outbreak, and I've been now in three Ebola epidemics, They're the standard operating procedure is to say, we have to do immediate contact tracing, we have to find every case, and then everybody who was near that case, so that we can round everybody up that might have it, and put them in isolation from the rest of society, and try and control the spread, and, and then we have to, as fast as possible, get a diagnostic lab set up, and all that. None of our standard operating procedure was implemented domestically. What, you know, I could not believe it, and I was saying it out loud on TV and what have you at the time, that we didn't, as soon as we had that nursing home outbreak in the state of Washington, that we didn't immediately set up cohorts uh, for surveillance inside of every single nursing home complex in America. And, we, and then similarly, when people were trying to figure out, should we close schools or not close schools, I said, set up cohorts. Do your, do your homework. Figure it out. Should we or shouldn't we close down the schools? Instead, the decisions were entirely political. And the same has been true with just about every single step of the response. And so at this point, we can't do, con I mean, it's crazy because it's just too massive, right? Um, and then on top of it all, now we do antigen home testing. So there's no database. It's gone. <laughs> yes, that's definitely problematic. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think definitely there, you know, we don't even know the true number, right? And so we're just sort of floating in, we have no idea. in space there <laughs> a little bit. Um, I wanted to touch on the, the science communication aspect, right? Since this has been a great bulk of your career in, in, this, in this profession. So what kinds of um, methods, right? So you mentioned social media, but, but how could we better have communicated and at what points were there really critical junctions in the pandemic that we really um, maybe should have turned a corner and then again, what do we do next time? Yeah, so uh, 
Um, I assume you all remember the swine flu epidemic of 2009, which was due to H1N1. And that occurred, you know, Obama had only been in office for three months. And he didn't even have a CDC director or a health and human services secretary um, or a FDA commissioner. I mean, all the key slots were unfilled. Um, and a, a temporary CDC director stepped up to the plate and tried to do decent communication and tell America what they should do and how to respond. Um, and it was at times a little chaotic. You had one you know, opinion coming out of CDC and then Tony Fauci was saying something else out of NIAID and then you had somebody over at HHS that was a low level individual saying something completely different. And the Obama administration said, okay, we can't go forward like this. We have to have one voice, right? So when Ebola happened in 2014, the Obama administration centralized the information and tried to have communications go out to the American people with one kind of policy voice. Um, and that was relatively easy to do because we only had what, five cases of Ebola on US territory. Um, and we were acting as the great neo-colonial uh, guardians of the galaxy, um, not as responding to our own people dying. Um, but the Trump administration kind of took a page from that and said, well then what we're gonna do is even gonna go further. We're gonna say that all the people involved in communicating the response have to stand next to President Trump in the White House and all communication will come from inside the White House. So there were no CDC press conferences. There were no NIH briefings for science writers. There still hasn't been a single one there were no uh, attempts to um, compartmentalize the information by agency or anything like that. So you had this debacle from day one where you had a man saying, drink bleach. Well, the officials had to sit with their mouth shut and Tony Fauci's on camera doing this. And that moment is the moment when the Republican Party said, we found our target. Our whole campaign will be kill Tony Fauci. Um, so I think the problem is that we have struggled as a country to figure out how to communicate public health information when it's emotionally charged. That's a given, it's been a problem all along. But in this case, by consolidating it in the White House, we just sabotaged ourselves. And it's not getting any better. I think it's clear that you know, Lori, you have an unparalleled ability to understand both the highly technical aspects of the microbiology and science and deep understanding of the historical and political context of epidemics and pandemics. Really unparalleled how you're bridging these two. And I'm curious if you could speak from what that perspective affords you for the importance of equity on a global scale. In my own work, I study health inequities within California, within the US. I look very little at it on a global scale. Your work forces you to think about it on a global scale. Yeah. So right now, the um, COP27 is meeting in Sharm el-Sheikh, uh, Egypt. And the number one issue that is dividing everything and is the reason we don't have any resolutions coming out of it is this issue, equity and justice. You know, Pakistan just had a NOAA-level flood and they're still not dried out because there's nowhere for the water to go. Um, Pakistan can't rebuild Pakistan without somebody helping them, some, some dollars or euros or something from somewhere else. And we can see that more and more of the world is saying to this handful of the super rich, um, where is equity, where is justice when you don't die in droves and we do? Um, you know, I remember when I was here at Santa Cruz, there was um, this weird song that the animals recorded, you know, Eric Burden and the animals. And it wasn't, what it was doing on a rock and roll album, I never knew. But 
it had this like Gregorian chanting going on. And Eric Burden in his really, you know, overladen voice told the story of um, a village in the Great Plague and the rich all go inside the castle and they pull up the bridge over the moat and leave the rest of the people to, on their own. And then when the, the plague stops, the people wonder, where is the king? Where are all these people? And they get into the castle and everybody is dead. Um, so this was classic, the animals. Um, but, but, you know, there's something to say for this. It's a metaphor for how we have approached this problem for decades, for centuries. Um, and this epidemic actually has spawned, you know, I showed you that we had this economic recovery underway in 2019. We were looking good. The economy felt fabulous. Anybody's IRA looked best ever, right? You're going to buy that beach house. Um, and now we're in this tremendous difficulty economically. It's really hard for any country to see a clear path out of the current economic crisis because in so many ways it's unprecedented. There are many features about it that don't make sense. Um, and clearly COVID is the key contributor to why we're in this mess. Um, and what, I, what, I, what we have seen though that is just unprecedented, didn't happen in any other prior epidemic, is that it has made a super elite class even richer beyond anybody's imagination. I mean, Jeff Bezos has, in, in any single day during the COVID epidemic, has made more than money than you know, thousands and thousands of human beings will make in a lifetime. Uh, and we've seen a skewing so that a, the percentage of global wealth that was in the hands of 1% of the world population is now in the hands of 0.001%. And, you know, here we are in a situation where a, a, a bozo like Elon Musk has the capacity to shake up the entire planet based on what, you know. So I think the, I think I would say that the, that the economic impact of all of this has been far beyond, you know, I, just a sidestep. I, um, Larry Summers, you all know who Larry Summers is. Larry Summers is one of the only major economists who actually looked at pandemics back in the day and asked, you know, what would be the toll financially and how would the global economy recover from if we had a 1918 level epidemic again? And he, together with Dean Jameson from World Bank, predicted that a major pandemic would cost the global economy, brace yourself, a hundred billion. <laughs> and all other economists were condemning him. This is outrageous. You exaggerate your, and as you saw, and we're now calling it the $16 trillion virus. So we're in no man's land. We're in uncharted territory. Um, I definitely agree with that. I, I, it would be great to see some projections to see where things will head and how to mitigate those, but I feel like, um, those really aren't out there, right, to really inform sort of what's next. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about the economy and sort of uh, the job sectors that maybe we need going forward, right? So again, how do we handle this better next time, right? We can only look forward. So what can we do as educators here um, to really support that? Hmm. I'm glad you asked that, but the, I think the answer is not what can the educators do. The answer is really about where are the financial incentives, and they're all in the wrong place. You know, I was describing the possibility of doing metagenomic surveillance, right? And there's really no major hurdle in place on a technology side or a scientific side um, that would that would render this impossible in any way. Um, where the price tag of sequencing has just plummeted to the point where there's now it's possible you can sequence your genome for $100. 
And in 2000, that was accomplished uh, you know, for more than a billion dollars involving more than 60 laboratories. So this is faster than Moore's law. There's really no, no reason we can't reach these goals except setting it as an aspiration and putting the money there. And what we saw with COVID was you set an aspiration for an mRNA vaccine, and you say we want it available in X amount of time. Guess what? Put money up front, and it, it appears. It's there. And as I said in my remarks, the problem was that the aspirational target we set was wrong. We didn't say, oh, you have to prevent transmission. No, we let you get off the hook on that one. All you have to do is make a medical vaccine, not a public health vaccine. So you make a vaccine that will keep you from being hospitalized. That's a medical vaccine. But where's the public health in that? Um, but I, I guess my feeling is that everywhere I go, college campuses all over the world, the interest is there among the kids. If it, they want to be out there. I mean, like most kids under 25, they're idealistic, they have dreams, they want to do something that's meaningful with their life, and, they re and global health is very attractive. They're there, they're ready to be there. The problem is, who's going to finance them? Where are they going to get a job? Who's going to, who is going to provide long-term permanent funding? I guarantee you, all this COVID money, it's going to go away. It's going to go away because the president said those fatal words. The pandemic is over on 60 Minutes. And I wanted to just, yeah. <laughs> I, nye, nye, nye. And the Republicans have been looking for an excuse to stop funding everything that has been this sort of um, gravy train associated with COVID. So I think, I mean, I think the problem is that Schools of public health and public health programs have to teach kids politics 101. They have to know, how do you put a bill before your city council and fight it through? How do, how do you go, what is the state legislature? How does the UN system work politically? And they have to become skilled at making the argument for sustained funding that will actually make it possible to, make, to realize their creative dreams. That's great advice. Yeah, no, I think that's kind of where we're trying to go with our degree program, right? Is really um, building a bridge across the divisions. Yeah, we have it right here, the sociologist, the biologist. <laughs> I mean, on the same stage? Oh. And no, nobody's putting somebody down? Wow. We like each other. Grant, do you wanna come up and help us field questions from the audience? So well, I'll just start and say, uh, if I could wave my magic wand and give you a few trillion dollars uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to uh, address the next pandemic, uh, there's the question of how you're going to spend the money, but also who are you going to let spend it? You talked about you know, the failures of the rich countries to really look within and try and close their borders. Uh, you talked about the UN. Is the UN strong enough uh, to do that, or do we need new structures to address uh, public health in a global manner? So the problem with the UN is that the Security Council has permanent members that will always vote no, China and Russia particularly. And attempts have been made to change the structure of the Security Council, but Fundamentally, you can't, it's just not going to happen. And the Bretton Woods institutions, I assume you know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. have similar built-in constitutional constructs that stipulate, you know, a European will run the IMF and uh, on and on and on, and the World Bank will do these things. And <clears throat> they don't make any sense in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So inst we have institutional uh, uh, bottlenecks all over the place and I mean even WHO you know it's amazing to me what people imagine WHO is and what it's capable of and then what the reality is if you know the institution and you know its constitution you know WHO the voting members of WHO the controlling members of WHO are ministers of health of every nation 
So what that means is if you're the Minister of Health of Russia, then you're not voting yes on anything unless Putin told you you could, right? And if you're the Minister of Health of the United States, it totally depends on who's the elected president and therefore which party you're in and how you will engage. And we saw the astounding thing that we had a president of the United States that said, we're leaving WHO, unprecedented. Um, so we don't have an easy institution to turn to. Now what's happened, each big crisis in health after another is that we've created new sort of satellite to the UN agencies. So first it was HIV crisis, we created UN AIDS. Then it was, okay, UN AIDS is garbage, it's not doing its job, so we created the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. We need to vaccinate children, we can't get equitable distribution of vaccine, so Gavi was created. And you go on and on and on down the list, and all we've done is create a more um, chaotic uh, architecture of global health that with far too many agencies, and each one going and begging the same donors for annual support of their budgets. At this point, the fragility of it, I mean, you said, what if we had three trillion? I mean, the fragility of it is that the single biggest giver is the United States government and the number two biggest giver is Bill Gates. <laughs> so if Bill Gates wakes up tomorrow and says, you know what, I'm sick of this global health stuff. I'm putting everything into climate change. Then literally, you could make a long list of programs that will suddenly end. They're just dead. And a whole lot of, uh, by the way, academic programs. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that fragility is insane. I mean, it's nuts. There was a lot of panic in the trenches when uh, Bill and Melinda were getting divorced and what will happen to the foundation and where will the money go and how will it be, oh my goodness. People were sweating that one. And it's still not entirely clear where that is all headed. Um, so. Grant, there isn't an agency I could say, yeah, these guys, they're set up to do it. They have the expertise, they have the smarts, and their constitution, their actual structure would allow them to do the job and do it right. We don't have that 21st century institution. It's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have a question from the audience? I think, Lori, the, the most disturbing thing I heard so far tonight was that there, you talked to students who thought that this place was somehow segregated back in the day. In the 70s, I was a Portuguese kid from Hayward. My sweet name was from a black kid from Compton and a Filipino kid from Stockton. Anyway, going forward, there's a lot of misinformation out in the world and misunderstanding. And I was really struck when you talked about RFK Jr. And rather than we need to censor this knucklehead. Your response is we need to engage him. And what do you think, getting back to what you were saying about uh, uh, our billionaire overlords, monopoly funding of a lot of the journalistic outlets, how do we get good inquiry and reporting out there to confront misinformation with facts? I mean, it, 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 we, we're not going to change Bill Gates overnight. But Journalists like you, um, you know, do make a difference. And how do we encourage that fact-based discussion so that we don't need to start talking about how do I censor on Facebook RFK Jr., but rather how do I confront with fact? Well, the problem is the horse is already out of the barn. Social media is already, you know, it's too far gone. The idea that, you know, just makes the certain changes over at the Facebook headquarters and you know, get the right guy to control Twitter. Oops. Um, and I, I think this whole question of can we get a good forum on Mastodon? Now, you know, that's everybody saying leave Twitter and go to Mastodon. That's going to be the saving grace. No. I see this problem as actually predating the arrival of Facebook and Twitter and all that um, because Journalism was already in severe crisis before these uh, social media formats came to dominate the landscape. 
um, almost every major news organization was in financial trouble. And it was because advertising had been the major source of income, and the really, the, the holy grail of advertising was classified ads. So, you know, when I was in, in the newspaper business, a broadsheet page for a full page ad from Bloomingdale's might cost Bloomingdale's, oh, I don't know, $100,000. But if you broke it up into line by line charge for classified ads, that was $300,000 for the same page. All of that went to Craigslist way before social media appeared. And all of a sudden, the whole news industry was in crisis. And similarly, advertising started bleeding away from network news and going over to cable news. And we know where that went. <laughs> and <clears throat> so then social media comes along, and that's just another layer on top of it all. So most journalists I know uh, that are in my age group are earning less today than they did when they were in their 20s as journalists because they're paid so poorly. Um, an article that I might have gotten enough to pay six months rent with in 1990 would today get me enough money to buy mm, the food I need for the month. And so the profession is it's filled with people who are on a mission because they're not making money unless they happen to have a gravy train job, you know, one of those precious few at the New York Times or Washington Post or something. And so the, it attracts a, a different kind of journalist than we once had. The caliber is very high. I mean, I don't want to demean people. There's a lot of extraordinary talent in journalism today, some of the best I've ever seen. But you have to have something else driving you because you're, you're not gonna pay the bills. And that changes the whole nature of things. So you have more and more people who have a mission. They have an underlying reason they're trying to grab your attention. And it's, um, it means the credibility of the information is going down. I think we have time for one last question. Oh, one more. Anyway, thank you very much for your frankness. Uh, you certainly dissected the biology and the economics and the politics. I'd ask you to comment on the irrationality abroad in the land, the, not just Robert Kennedy, uh, uh, but the whole thing about the craziness. Uh, the anti-vaxxers, once you show that they're all dying at great rates, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and whether that kind of phenomenon uh, existed uh, in your experience in other pandemics or epidemics that you've seen, and um, they didn't teach me anything about that kind of response in public health school. <laughs> so I actually think that there's something genetic in human beings that um, makes us especially fearful of um, infectious diseases. It doesn't matter what culture you go in, what, what part of the world. There is a, an element in every social grouping that responds irrationally. And conspiracy theories have been a common theme going all the way back to ancient Rome. Um, and you can see them repeated over and over again. I, I mean, the example that I always like to point to is 1994, a uh, pneumonic plague, not bubonic, pneumonic plague broke out in Gujarat. It had actually started in Maharashtra, uh, India, and then spread as bubonic, and then spread to Gujarat, Surat in particular, in the form of pneumonic. I was there, and I was in the middle of it, and the hysteria was unbelievable across India. And this for a completely treatable, 100% preventable disease. I mean, the cheapest antibiotics out there are sufficient to deal with plague, both as prophylaxis and treatment. And a simple mask is all you need if you're around a pneumatic source. So it's not the 14th century, right? But India went bananas, and plague cases were diagnosed in every single district of India. 90% of them were false diagnosis. And they, of course, concluded that 
the microbe had, was made in Pakistan <laughs> and that the Pakistani intelligence forces had released it. And this wasn't like some weird offbeat conspiracy. This was mainstream news in India. The equivalent of Walter Cronkite was saying that. So, uh, and you know, with Ebola, our constant struggle in every single Ebola outbreak is that the most Ebola has broken out in societies where religion is kind of a mix of ancient spiritual beliefs and whatever is kind of the mainstream Islam or Christianity that came from the colonial you know, overlay. And so uh, you'll see people have uh, amulets or tokens of some kind that they think will be protective. And they will go to a witch doctor maybe before they'll go to the hospital and delay treatment for days until they're in such dire shape that, you know, and then there will be the conspiracy. The last time I was, one, last epidemic I was in, the th running theory was that it was all Europeans spreading this thing so that they could steal your kidneys and sell them back in Europe. It's quite an elaborate theory. And so I would say that conspiracy theories are always a companion of epidemics because epidemics incite fear and there's unknown. And if there were an instant way to stop an epidemic, there'd be no conspiracies because it would just be over. But the prolonged and, and the fact that science is a process rather than an instant answer and truism so that what seems to be the truth today, science will then know a little differently tomorrow, that contributes to this notion in the general public that they don't really know. Yeah. <laughs> They're making it up. Or, you know, they did it. It was made in a lab. That guy, he did it. Uh, what his motive is, I don't know. It doesn't matter. And then, what we had as an overlay that was unprecedented was that the number one source of disinformation was the President of the United States. Well, with that, happy <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Uh, but I'm bummed. I'd like to thank our speaker, uh, Laurie Garrett, again.